Good afternoon and welcome to ReproAction's Act and Learn webinar for November 2019. Today's topic is important and exciting. We're going to be talking about self-managed abortion in global context. So first we'll introduce your host. We are the co-founders and co-directors of ReproAction. The first voice you're hearing is myself, Erin Matson. I use she, her pronouns. I'm based in Arlington, Virginia, and you can find me on Twitter at Erin Tuzamax. And I am Pamela Merritt. My pronouns are she, her. I am based in St. Louis, Missouri, and you can find me on Twitter at SharkFu. Great, and we thank you for joining us on this uh, impeachment day that I know has many people glued to a variety of screens. So first, we'll introduce Repro Action. We will talk about organizing for self-managed abortion with pills in the United States. And then we will have an in-depth presentation from two seasoned experts in the field on self-managed abortion in global context. We're extremely pleased and proud to be joined by Naomi Brain, who is a PhD in sociology professor and department chairperson at Brooklyn College, and Susan Yanow, MSW, who is one of the co-founders of Women Help Women, among the many hats that she wears in reproductive health consulting. We'll move to next steps and then Q&A. And you are absolutely free, welcome, and encouraged to tweet during this webinar if you would like. We ask that you use the hashtag ReproAction. Um, also know that at any point, if you have questions, you're welcome to chat them into the chat box. Pamela will moderate a Q&A at the end, and we'll get to as many as possible at the end, so you don't have to wait until the end if you have a question. Um, finally, I just want to share a frequent question that comes up while we are uh, hosting these webinars. Yes, we will make a recording of this webinar, which will be publicly available on our website, and we'll send it out to everyone on our email list once it's up there. So um, while we encourage you to follow along, tweet along, and take notes, know that this will be available for you later. So first, by way of introduction, ReproAction group leading bold direct action to increase access to abortion and advance reproductive justice. We're deeply proud of our left flank analysis. We are known within the field for our willingness to hold folks on all sides of the issues accountable, whether they are traditionally considered allies or opponents of reproductive rights. Finally, we have a deep commitment and expertise in nonviolent direct action as one of the tools in our toolbox. So a bit about our work on self-managed abortion with pills, because Repro Action has been doing community organizing around the country for more than two years, getting the word out about self-managed abortion with pills, as well as doing confrontational direct actions and more with decision makers. And I want to talk about the why. Um, I'm going to leave most of the what to our experts on the call today, Naomi and Susan. But I do want to talk about the why and why we're doing this work in the United States. We are doing this work because we know that self-managed abortion with pills is safe and effective. We are doing this because, frankly, abortion pills are awesome, and everyone should know how they work. These are simple, safe, and effective tools to end a pregnancy. We also do this work because we trust people. We believe in empowering them with information. We see no reason to gatekeep this important information. We are doing this work because Roe v. Wade is likely to be gone or gutted within the next one to two years, and there is already an abortion access crisis in the United States, no matter what the Supreme Court does. And we know that this abortion access crisis disproportionately impacts women and people of color, uh, LGBTQ people, people in rural areas, red states, people with disabilities, and this is something that's important, but at the same time, we want to hold up that self-managed abortion with pills is something that we don't simply see as an as a issue of something of last resort in a dire situation. There are a variety of reasons why someone might want to self-manage their abortion using pills, including convenience, simply wanting to have an abortion at home, having concerns about their gender, uh, being respected in a medical provider, um, it could be concerns about immigration and getting deported if they show up in a healthcare provider. So there's a variety of reasons, and I just want to be clear that we started, I said we started this work uh, more than two years ago, and that was before the dramatic shift in the Supreme Court. So while we welcome all of the interest that has come to self-managed abortion with pills following 
the disastrous confirmation of Justice Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court. This is bigger than that. Um, we trust people, and we know that people deserve to have this empowering information. Um, our work on self-managed abortion with pills is also infused with a deep belief that abortion opponents are going to fail. And they say that they are going to stop abortion, and they can't. No matter what they do to the laws, no matter what bans they pass, no matter what violence and intimidation they put against abortion providers, and who else they throw in jail. And I want to make that clear. It's not just that people will go to jail when abortion is banned. People are already going to jail for self-managed abortion. They are already going to jail for pregnancy outcomes in the United States, and we will simply see more of that. However, we know that abortion with pills and self-managed abortion with pills really undermines the long-term solvency of the anti-abortion movement like no other, because they cannot stop abortion. They simply cannot. So just briefly, I want to showcase that ReproAction has been doing some really um, cutting-edge work that we are fiercely proud of um, throughout the United States. We have been leading community forums and open discussions on the status of abortion rights in a given community and um, self-managed abortion with pills. Some they all have different themes. Sometimes we discuss criminalization of abortion and pregnancy. We've been giving presentations at universities and in um, various venues around the country. We have been doing in-depth sessions with activists where we go through the World Health Organization protocol in deep detail on using abortion pills to safely and effectively end a pregnancy within the first 12 weeks. We have flyered all over town, and by town I mean many towns. We have run uh, video campaigns. We are in the ground in so many states, um, including, and this is not a full list by any means, but um, from the Mid-Atlantic where I'm based, so DC, Maryland, Virginia, in the Midwest, we have Missouri and in the Upper South as well, Arkansas, Texas, New York, Louisiana, Ohio, and more. We are coming to new communities soon, and we will be hiring more part-time fellows in coming in the new year. Um, to do more on the ground organizing for self-managed abortion with pills. If this is something that interests you personally or you know qualified folks who would be good fit for this work, please do keep an eye on our website and um, please share those announcements. We have found that people routinely um, come to our sessions and when they leave, one of the most frequent words that we hear is empowered. Um, people feel empowered by getting this information. Um, another piece of our work is we have been demanding accountability for criminalization of abortion and pregnancy outcomes, which is critical when we talk about self-managed abortion with pills, um, which people are already being prosecuted for in the United States. We know that the logical consequence of abortion bans and all supposedly pro-life policy is sending women and people who can become pregnant to jail. We have an innovative Stop Prosecuting Abortion campaign where we, are, we have spoken directly with abortion opponents, including members of Congress and anti-abortion movement leaders and, um, and high-level protesters around the country, asking them questions about um, whether they believe that women should go to jail if they self-manage their abortion. We have released 11 videos to date, and um, if you're on our email list, you should be watching our inbox for another announcement soon. But I just want to highlight that in, this, in these videos, we've received a range of responses, including Congressman Ron Wright out of Texas, who actually just introduced a bill trying to further restrict um, telemedicine and the re restrictions on people being able to prescribe uh, safe, and abortion, safe and effective abortion pills over um, telemedicine, which is ridiculous. He actually told us that women should, quote, absolutely, unquote, face punishment for abortion, um, and he thought that was appropriate. We also um, show some anti-abortion movement leaders telling us flatly that they believe that uh, women should be executed for having abortion. So we are demanding that accountability, both with videos and in the streets. And we want you to get involved. So um, just know this, will, uh, this presentation will be available, but to get information about self-managed abortion with pills, you can go to reproaction.org slash FMA. 
to watch and share those original videos and sign petitions from our Stop Prosecuting Abortion campaign, you can do so at reproaction.org slash stop. Um, sign up to get alerts about these community education events that I was just speaking about and opportunities to take direct action in your community at reproaction.org slash sign up. And if you'd like to just give to support our work, you can do so at reproaction.org slash donate. So it is my absolute pleasure to introduce two esteemed colleagues in the field to talk us through self-managed abortion in global context and provide a bit more gritty information about self-managed abortion. Um, first, I'm pleased to introduce Naomi Brain, who is a professor and department chairperson for sociology at Brooklyn College. Her interest in harm reduction and community action focuses on women's health and her professional work is deeply informed and shaped by her long history as a social justice activist. And credit where credit is due, I just let our listeners know that Naomi actually came up with the idea for this webinar and suggested it, and I just want to thank her for that. So thank you for joining us this afternoon, Naomi. My pleasure. And I'm also extremely pleased to introduce um, Susan Yano, who is a longtime reproductive rights activist who works to expand access to abortion domestically and internationally. She's a co-founder of Women Help Women, an international organization that provides medication abortion services. She also coordinates the Later Ab Abortion Initiative at IBIS Reproductive Health. And I want to also personally thank Susan without whom um, all of that work that I just said ReProAction has been doing for more than two years would not have been possible. Um, Susan flew in um, from her location and actually sat with our staff from around the country and did a several hour training on self-managed abortion with pills. And she's just, she's a, a gem and a resource for the entire movement. So Susan, thank you for joining us this afternoon as well. Thank you, Erin. Great. All right. Well, I will hand it over to you. Okay. So, um, hi, everybody. Thank you for joining. And thank you, Erin, for that uh, lovely introduction. Naomi and I are going to tag team this. And since we're not sitting in the same room, you might hear us have conversations together about which slide is we're going to do which. But we've had many, many, many conversations over the last few years about this issue. And we're excited to do this together. Um, so I wanted to start by defining what we're going to be talking about, because many people have different ideas about what self -managed, the term self-managed abortion means. And we're going to be talking about the practice of self-sourcing the abortion medicines, either mifepristone and misoprostol or misoprostol alone, self-using the medicines with or without uh, friends and community around, and completing the abortion, managing the abortion without a clinician and outside of the clinical context. We're not going to be talking about herbs, which some people do use, but the scientific effectiveness of herbs has not yet been shown. And we're also not going to be talking about some of the uh, dangerous methods that people have historically used and in some places are currently using to try to end a pregnancy when they're not at a clinic. Next slide. So I want to start by giving, uh, by emphasizing what Aaron said. These pills are safe and effective, but beyond that, if this wasn't about abortion, these pills would be over the counter. They belong in our hands. And this is not a new idea. Back in the 1980s, Misoprostol, the brand name is Cytotec, uh, was widely introduced throughout Latin America to treat gastric ulcers. And these wonderful people who put out these pills had a warning on the side that said, not for use by pregnant women could cause uterine contractions. And very smart women in Brazil read that and said, hmm, as you all may know, uh, abortion is not legal in most of Latin America, including Brazil. The way that the, this community-based use of abortion pills came to the attention of science was that there was an ob guy who was also an epidemiologist, Annabel Fuentes, who was keeping track of maternal mortality from unsafe abortion across Latin America. And all of a sudden, in the early 1980s, he noticed a drop in maternal deaths in Brazil. And the next year, he noticed that same drop, and he couldn't figure it out. 
why would one country suddenly have a lower rate of uh, death from unsafe abortion? And he was very fortunate that his partner was a sociologist and she went out in the field and learned about women using misoprostol. Since then, the World Health Organization has established the most efficacious way to use misoprostol alone. And it's also used with nephropristone, but the foundational, let's call it research, was done by women in communities. So I always wanna start there because these pills belong to us. They should have always been in our hands. Next slide. So this is really a movement of the global South. And I think honestly, that's one of the reasons why it's less available or less visible. I shouldn't say that, why it's less visible um, than some other movements in the United States. So the first safe abortion hotline was created in Ecuador in 2008 and support for self-managed abortion spread pretty rapidly through Latin America, Africa, and parts of Asia. I'll, um, as you can see from a couple of the, the aborto con medicamentos and misoprostol is the one on the right is from an African organization in Nigeria. Um, so this is a movement that is that is global, uh, um, but largely invisible in the United States. And just to expand on Naomi's point, the um, Human Rights Treaty, which the United States did not sign, embraces the legal right to give and receive information and to benefit from science and scientific discovery. Um, although the United States is not a party to that, um, in the United States, it is still legal to share information that is on the World Health Organization website. And that is the basis of work in the US. It's the basis of the legality of what Repro Action is doing around the country, what other organizations are doing around the country um, to share information. But it's based, and I wanna be, it's based on the models um, from the Global South, particularly Latin America, where um, for, 12, for 15 years, feminist groups have been uh, trying to expand information about how to use misoprostol for safe abortion. And this legal right to give and receive information is globally the legal underpinning <clears throat> for the activist groups, the feminist organizations and activists and their work that we'll be talking about in this presentation. Yes. Could you go to the next slide? So uh, this just, uh, it illustrates, by illustrating where abortion laws are restrictive, particularly restrictive, I don't think the U.S. should be in green at this point, but it is, technically. Um, this also functions in some ways as a map of the places where abortion hotlines and accompaniment, which is another related strategy, have proliferated. Uh, um, not all of the countries in orange and red have hotlines within them, but many of them do, yes. certainly throughout the Americas, but also in growing, uh, growing regions of sub-Saharan Africa, uh, um, in Poland, in parts of Asia, in Indonesia, uh, um, hotlines have spread widely. And just to be clear for folks, those little circles that don't show up so well is where there is a, a hotline currently functioning. So you can see them all through the left-hand side of Latin America. There's one circle in the US. And if you look you, carefully, it doesn't show up as well as we hoped it would. Um, you can see them in Thailand, in South Korea, and in, uh, in uh, Pakistan, for example as well as Poland. So that's what and, those little circles are. And in 2019, now in 2019, there would be more of those little circles in yeah. Sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah. And more in Central America, yeah. Yeah. All right, ready to go to the next? 
So we wanted to give you a sense of how many hotlines there were. And these are just the, you know, the logos from a few of them. Um, many of these hotlines were started by either Women on Waves or Women Help Women, the organization that I belong to. But in particularly in Latin America, many of the hotlines were started by community groups with support from community groups in other countries. So it wasn't all a north to south, uh, north to south work. And in fact, one of the things that Women Help Women has been doing is creating a network of African countries who can support each other and building networks in Latin America where there can be more community to community support. But across in all of the countries listed, just to give you a sense of what's happened since 2008, there are hotlines that are either uh, voice recognition systems. In other words, somebody calls uh, chooses the language, gets information, and then can leave a number for a callback, or there are hours during which the hotline is staffed. Some of the hotlines work with text, some work with emails. It very much depends on the security issues in the country where the hotline is um, exists. Next slide. So I just wanted to give you one example of how these hotlines get set up. And uh, Aaron talked about um, us all meeting in uh, a couple of years ago to do a training. And that's very much based on the model that we've used in other countries. However, um, in most countries where we've done a training, this is from our training in Indonesia, um, we go in for three full days depending on the level of the participants. We start with basic reproductive and sexual health information. We do a training about how to use abortion pills. And then we have a conversation about security and security needs and follow up with whatever security training folks might need. And we talk about dissemination strategies. So as you heard from Aaron about some of repro actions, dissemination strategies, of give, you know, holding house parties, using stickers, giving webinars. Uh, what Indonesia decided was to set up a, hot, a hotline and we helped them with that technology. So in each country that Women Help Women works in, um, the outcome is very much determined by the people on the ground and what they think will work best in their communities. Next slide. So we've been talking mostly about hotlines, but around the world, this is done in a variety or assistance with self-managed abortion. I should really say feminist assistance with self-managed abortion <laughs> happens in a wide variety of ways. Um, um, so and the the links in here are all to websites associated with organizations uh, um, that support women with self-managed abortion and provide education about the use of medication. Uh, uh, so actually, Erin, can we go to Como Hacerse un Aborto for a moment? Great. So uh, here's an example of one of these websites. This one is not for a specific organization. It pools information for all of Chile plus a little bit about Argentina off on the right. Uh, so as you can see, there are emails that connect somebody to local collectives. And these are all collectives in Chile. They're not funded and well-funded NGOs. Uh, um, for the most part, these are groups of women, often young women, but not always, uh, um, who work together to provide education and to provide often accompaniment, which I will talk about in a moment. There is a manual off to the side there, Manual de Laborto con Pastillas. And I can tell you, uh, um, while this information is the surface, the front, what we're looking at is all in Spanish. It is also available in Creole through this website. Um, and I think also in one of the dominant Mapuche languages. Uh, um, there's a drop down all the way on the right uh, that for me is, is actually hidden behind the webinar control panel uh, that allows you to choose a language. And they have translated their, um, their manual 
for my conversation with activists into CRAIL, which could be very useful in this country as well. Um, all right, so so let's go back to the diverse strat. Well, all right, but, okay, while we're on websites, click on Miss Rosie for a moment so we can see. So Miss Rosie is um, one of the, uh, possibly the largest of the African hotlines. Um, and it's part of an organization called Gawain, and that that is an NGO that does work around women and youth. Uh, um, and as you can see, the Miss Rosie hotline was launched in 2014. It has now gone 24-7 with a voice recognition system powered by solar batteries. So uh, the level of technology here is impressive and entirely locally appropriate. Uh, um, so that when they lose electricity, the solar backup kicks in. Uh, um, so, so yeah, these guys are amazing. Um, I spent a couple of days with them not too long ago. Um, all right, so if you can flip back to diverse strategies. Let me run through this. Okay, so hotlines we've been talking about. Um, it's important to emphasize that this really runs from disposable cell phones through 24-hour voice response systems. Um, and you know there are activists who hand a cell phone around within a group, each person taking a turn answering it um, in the most basic level of accessibility that you can imagine. And then there are people who get paid to respond to messages and to answer during business hours. So a hotline can be a really wide variety of things. And it can also be email messages. Uh, um, it can be text messages. It can take any form of electronic communication, basically. Accompaniment is, not, is sometimes separate from hotlines, but not intrinsically. Um, accompaniment is the idea of maintaining an ongoing connection by text, email, phone, or sometimes even in person throughout the process of a woman experiencing a self-managed abortion. So a woman might reach out to uh, an accompaniment organization and get some basic information about how to use pills, about the, the World Health Organization protocol for use of pills, as well as some other information relevant to her situation. And if she decides that she wants to obtain pills and go through with the process, she would obtain pills and then be in ongoing contact with somebody or sometimes more than one person um, in the organization as they stay with her, providing ongoing information and support, largely informative support, through the completion of the process so that she can ask questions about, you know, well, I've started having cramps. Is this the right time? Uh, um, how this is, I've gone through this number of maxi pads. Should I be worried or is this normal? This is my pain level. Uh, um, so that there is ongoing communication in an accompaniment. Uh, um, and again, this is about providing information. It's largely about answering questions that enable the woman to make informed decisions in an ongoing way for herself through what may be for some a stressful process. Um, so there are also community health workers. Oh, one more. on the accompaniment thing, there's so there's two web links there. The Socoristas are probably the largest accompaniment organization in South America. Um, they're amazing and delightful. Fondo Maria, if some of you who may be with abortion funds here in the United States may be somewhat familiar with Fondo Maria, they provide, they, they work in a variety of ways around this, um, including doing some work that is similar in, they're in Mexico City, and they do some work that is similar to that of abortion funds. Um, so there are also community health workers, and this covers a wide range of roles. They may be health educators, they may be doulas or midwives. Um, I was in Chile a year or so ago, and was speaking with some activists there and asked them, 
about the southern and more rural regions of Chile where there may not be local hotlines um, and where internet access and cell phone access may be sketchy. Um, and their response was essentially that midwives have long performed a variety of functions um, related to women's reproduction. And that, that is globally and historically true. Uh, long preceding um, the modern pharmaceutical industry or the modern medical system. Um, and it continues to be true in many parts of the world today. And one aspect of that that is particularly important in relation to midwives and community resource workers is that misoprostol is also commonly used as a, as a strategy for treating or preventing postpartum hemorrhage. So midwives may already be familiar with misoprostol as part of their practice in relation to the management of the risk of postpartum hemorrhage. Um, and uh, so it's a medication they have access to and are familiar with. And community resource workers can offer education and support about SMA along with a wide range of other health issues for women and young adults. Uh, and finally, of course, there are a range of websites. There's a possibility of telemedicine. Uh, um, websites that provide information like the Como Hacerse en Aborto and the website of Women Help Women. Uh, um, there is a website that was set up a couple of years ago in the U.S. called Plan C Pills. Um, and for those of you who are thinking, is there an app for that? The answer is yes. And Susan can tell you about that. But before we go to that slide, I just want to add one thing that the Socaristas have just published a book about their practice of accompaniment, specifically about accompanying women in the second trimester. They support women all the way through 23 weeks who are using abortion pills. If anybody, and it, we've just had it translated into English. So if anybody would like to read it in either English or Spanish, the book is available on the womenhelp.org on, on the Women Help Women website. Um, we are hoping people will choose to give a small donation to the Socaristas if they download the book, but the book is available. Great. Um, okay, next slide. <laughs> so uh, as we've been talking about, each country tries to figure out what is appropriate for their context. And I'm really excited to introduce all of you to Yuki, which was developed for the US context. It is a, an app that is free from, you, people can download it. It is totally private and confidential, unlike uh, Missouri, where people were using period trackers that then uh, the government could get a hold of. This does have a period tracker in it. All data stays in the phone. This was developed by with uh, donor money, so there's no need to commercialize it. It is so safe and confidential that it has a passcode to get into it, if your passcode is 1234, and an intrusive parent or partner says, I want to see your phone, that app you've been using, tell me the password. You can say a different password, like 78910 that you've pre-programmed, they will get the Yuki screen that will take them to a whole different website. So it is totally safe and secure. It has information about contraception, STI prevention, miscarriage, and in the abortion section is both information about how to find a clinic and information about how to manage one's own abortion with pills. So we're very excited about this as a way to expand on the work that, for example, Repro Action is doing and many community groups are doing to support those who, for whatever reason, whether it's lack of access or personal preference, are choosing to use abortion pills on their own. Next slide. And there is a website in the U.S. with a helpline. SAS, Self-Managed Abortion Safe and Supported, is a website, abortionpillinfo.com, that is staffed by the counselors of Women Help Women um, overseas, so that people who have a specific question while they're self-managing their abortion and don't have access to a community group that is supporting them can contact our counselors 
they get back a randomized web link. They can go to that web link to get their answer. And then that information is disappeared in seven days so that there's no electronic trail should they have any, uh, to avoid any future legal problems. SAS also does provide trainings. Um, we were so thrilled to, to provide training to Repro Action. We've provided training to URGE. We are doing trainings with the National Network of Abortion Funds regional convenings at each of their uh, four convenings, one of which is coming up in another week in Milwaukee. Um, we are providing trainings for individual abortion funds, for community groups, and basically for anybody who wants to learn about this. So it is um, the same kind of training that ReproAction was talking about. If anybody on the call has a group of people that want to learn more about abortion pills, contact us, contact ReproAction, um, whoever is closest will, uh, will respond. Um, last slide, please. So this is just some logos of some of the different organizations. Uh, um, uh, so the MAMA logo in the beige circle of MAMA is one of the other um, Africa is for the MAMA network, which is this network that Susan mentioned that is being built through multiple countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, um, Auntie Jane is the, the Gawain. Uh, oh no, Auntie Jane, sorry, is, is connected to an organization in Kenya. Um, right, Miss Rosie is the good wine, but uh, um, so yeah, I thought it would just be fun to see uh, um, to see some of the logos of these different organizations. I've always been very fond, in particular, of the red sneakers of the Socceristas. Yeah, uh, um, but and uh, we wanted to show you all of these logos partly just to make it so clear that the work we're doing in the U.S. is based on. Yeah, the in innovative uh, history of activism and community support and fierce feminism around claiming these pills as our own. So with that, we thank you so much and we welcome comments and questions about any of these groups or about the work in the US or anything else. Yeah. Thank you so much to Susan and Naomi. Um, before we get, and folks, I know you must have questions and comments, so feel free to put those in the chat box and we'll get to as many of them as possible in a few moments. Um, before we move there, I have one follow-up question for each of you, and it is the same. Um, just if you could say, what is the number one thing you want US-based reproductive health rights and justice activists to take away from the experience of self-managed abortion in global context? Um, Naomi, do you want to take that first? Sure. Um, you know, it's hard to pick just one thing, but it seems to me the overwhelming message to me about this work, as I have learned about it, um, over the last few years, and as I have come to know activists globally who are doing this work, is that it can be done. It can be done under virtually any conditions, including some, uh, you know, from countries where it is completely banned to countries where there is a certain amount of wiggle room within the law um, or ambiguity and that activists have been doing it, it can be done, um, and it can be done here as well. And if, you know, if it can be done in Chile prior to the change in the law there and in places like Nicaragua and Honduras, um, um, it can be adapted here as well. And that uh, that feminist activists globally have figured out ways to adapt this information, to circulate it, to share it, to support women in ways that make sense for their context. And, uh, um, and I have deep confidence that US activists have the same capacity and can learn from what has, and as others, activists have done, learn from what others are doing and figure out how to make it your own. Yeah. Yeah, I think I would piggyback on that to say that while we have to continue to fiercely defend 
uh, legal access to abortion and fight for clinic-based, hospital-based, medical-based abortion because everybody should have the right to that and the state has an obligation to provide health care. We also have to free these pills and liberate them. And my, uh, if I had one wish, it would be that every single person who cares about abortion access would learn about these pills, would understand these pills. I talk to so many people who say they're pills that can stop a pregnancy. Um, and that's just a terrible gap in our own sexual education. So uh, my one call would be to uh, put these instructions up in multiple languages, every place we can think of, and to educate ourselves, but also to understand that self-managed abortion is an important part of the uh, tools we have in our toolbox to have reproductive justice and reproductive freedom, but it's not a silver bullet. And so we need to keep fighting on all fronts. Thank you. You've given us so much to think about. So just a few housekeeping things, and then we'll move to Q&A. I want to encourage everyone to sign up for alerts at www.reproaction.org. Um, that way you won't miss our work on self-managed abortion with pills, both nationally as well as possible local events in your area, depending where you live. Um, also, those self-managed abortion with pills resources are at www.reproaction.org SMA. Our Stop Prosecuting Abortion campaign is at reproaction.org slash stop. And we encourage you to follow us on social media. We are ReproAction on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. My number one ask is to go to reproaction.org and sign up to receive email alerts. That way you won't miss a single thing, including um, uh, invitation to our next webinar. So we host these Act and Learn webinars every month. Uh, we do them to share information, bring together activists, share strategies, learn what's working and what's not, and dive deep into topics. And our next webinar for December, they are monthly, they are free of charge. If you sign up for our email alerts, you'll never miss the invitation. Um, and Thursday, December 5th at 7 p.m. Eastern, we'll be leading a webinar on Repro Action's Best of 2019. So if you want to have a, a good old activism party, uh, cuddle up with your slippers and um, bring your smiles, and we hope to see you on Thursday, December 5th. And with that, I will pass it over to Pamela to lead us through Q&A. Thank you so much, Erin. Uh, this has been quite an awesome webinar. So I am not at all surprised that we have fantastic questions. Um, if you do have a question and you haven't already done so, um, please do drop it into the question tab on the GoToWebinar control panel. So our first question um, was early on in the webinar, but it's never um, a bad thing to uh, to revisit um, regional and um, continent specific um, information. So this is for we'll start with um, Susan, um, but both of you can weigh in on this about specific resources um, and information in Africa and the need for these educational materials in Africa. So the MAMA Network, which stands for Mobilizing Activists for Medical Abortion, um, it's currently involved in seven countries and about to spread to six Francophone countries. So the, um, as Naomi said, misoprostol is available over the counter in most African countries. The governments have had it registered because two pills under the tongue within one minute of an unattended birth reduces the chance of postpartum hemorrhage by 50% because misoprostol causes the uterus to contract. So, but people don't know that 12 pills of misoprostol can cause an abortion in the first trimester. So these groups are working uh, in a variety of ways to get the word out. Um, as challenging as it is to get uh, information out in the US, as you can imagine, in countries where many people, fewer people have access to the internet, uh, there are many people who are not literate. Uh, getting this information out to people who need it is a challenge, but uh, but people are are very much working on it. Does that? That was great. Thank you. Can I, uh, can I jump in just absolutely. for a moment on that one? 
Um, so Africa is certainly one of the places where community-based workers right. have been central to getting information and support out. Uh, um, and th there are organizations part of the mom that are part of the current MAMA network that have community organizers and community resource people in a variety of in in a variety of locations in um, more rural areas who help uh, who are community resources around a wide range of health and sexuality issues only one of which happens to involve misoprostol either around postpartum hemorrhage or around abortion um, so it's part of the community worker strategy is also about not separating and isolating abortion but saying that people need access to information about a wide range of sexual and reproductive health issues and this is only one of them but it is one of them um, and it's more of a reproductive justice approach in many ways thank you both for those thoughtful resources and answers um, the next question is um, what somebody is asking that y'all reshare or share the, give the name of the translated book one more time. Sure. Um, this book, it's by the Socaristas. And if you just hold on a second, I will find the, it's on the women. Womenhelp.org is the Women Help Women website. Um, if anybody has problems finding it on the website, they can email Aaron or Pamela, and they will get a message to me and I will send you the link. But it is under resources uh, on the Women Help Women link. And it is, um, I don't remember the title of the book, unfortunately. But oh, that's I, okay. Let me just type that in, uh, reproaction.org. Um, so you can email reproaction at reproaction.org if you have trouble finding it under Women Help Women. I'm sorry, womenhelp.org under resources. Thank you so yeah. much. All right, next question. Um, uh, this next question is wondering about how folks do medication distribution in extremely rural communities, um, uh, particularly those with limited postal access. Um, so in many of the contexts where people work, um, this is a criminalized activity including in the US. So um, I wouldn't be able to get into specifics of okay. how people get medicines and then redistribute them. Um, but safe to say people are very innovative. And what I will just say is if one can imagine how cocaine gets into places <laughs> when it's not supposed to, um, one can imagine how abortion pills might get in. Yes. They're Drugs and medications move through many different channels all over the world. Um, it, it is also useful to remember that there are, as Susan referenced in relation to Africa, where misoprostol is over the counter, that is, it is also over the counter in Mexico and a variety of Latin American countries. Um, so it is a medication whose where the level of legal control exerted varies considerably country to country. Thank you for that. Our next question is um, um, just a request to, if you could share a bit more about how you trained people um, to talk to medical medica medical providers, I'm sorry, in countries where abortion is illegal. Um, and uh, this is specifically about if somebody should visit a healthcare provider um, over concerns with complications? Sure, that's a great question. Part of the training that ReproAction does and that SAS does and that Women Help Women does is to help people understand that abortion pills cause a miscarriage. Miscarriage happens in 15 to 20 percent of all pregnancies. If a person and the risk of a complication from a spontaneous miscarriage or an abortion with pills is exactly the same, the treatment for it is exactly the same. So if a person has any concern, whether they have a complication, whether they're bleeding too much, whether they think they have an infection or whether they're just worried, a person can go to a medical professional 
um, all emergency rooms know how to treat miscarriage because it happens so commonly, and say that they are having a miscarriage and they will get the care that they need. If a person says that they used abortion pills, they could have legal problems. Of the 21 people in the US who've been arrested, 15 of them were turned in by medical providers when they went to get medical assistance. So people should not be afraid to get medical care. People need to get medical care if they have medical concerns. There is a very slight chance of a complication when using these pills. It gets a little, that chance gets a little higher if one is later in pregnancy. As long as the person fully understands what to say, they will get the medical care that they need and not face legal risk. Thank you so much for that. Um, the next question, I know the answer to this, but I'm gonna ask it so that you can speak it out again. Um, is the SAS website counselors available to assist people in the US? And is Yuki available for folks to use in the US as well? So Yuki was designed for the US. It is 100% for folks in the US. In fact, um, it has things like uh, signs of an infection or a fever in Fahrenheit which makes it clear that it's only for the US because nobody else uses Fahrenheit to measure fevers. Um, it, link, it has links to clinics in the US. We are hoping that a Spanish version will be available by the end of the year, but Yuki is specifically for the United States. In terms of SAS, uh, the counselors are overseas, but they have US specific information so that uh, if a person says what state they're in, they can be given information about clinics and abortion funds in that state. Uh, the counselors have um, a lot of U.S. specific information to support people who are in the U.S. Obviously, the process of using the pills is international, but the kinds of supports that might be available, for example, in the U.S., people do have the option of getting financial support and going to a clinic, which doesn't exist in other places where women help women work. So, um, so people in the US can feel very comfortable contacting the Women Help Women counselors. Thank you. And um, for uh, folks who are already dropping questions and wondering, wondering what the Yuki site is, the app is available in the App Store. And I think it's important that it is spelled E-U-K-I. And maybe we could put back up that slide, which is second to the last one, which has a picture of it so people can see how it's spelled. And if you want a little more information on Yuki, if you go to the Women Help website, um, you can click on something that just describes Yuki. Um, of course, you can download it and learn about it that way too. But um, there is, for those of us who occasionally like to read descriptions, um, it is readily available at the womenhelp.org. And just, I did find the link for the person who was asking about the Socarista book. If oh, yes. One, if one goes, I've sent it, the full link to Pamela and to Aaron, but if people go to womenhelp.org and look under resources and then under manuals and training materials, both the English and the Spanish version are there, as well as um, our other manuals and everything on the Women Help website is open source. People should feel free to um, access anything there. The training manual that we use for Mama in Africa is there. Uh, the publication on obstetric violence that was done by our Latin American colleagues is there. So um, how, and information about uh, combating stigma by supporting the independent use of abortion medicines is there in three languages. So anything on our website, uh, people are welcome to access. Fantastic. So I'm just going to pause for uh, to allow if there are any more questions, please do put them into the question tab, which is on your go to webinar control panel. Um, I can attest that I downloaded Yuki and um, I've also shared it with uh, people who have been alarmed at um, recent news in my home state of Missouri of um, uh, public officials tracking menstrual cycles and websites and spreadsheets. So um, people were very relieved that there is um, this option out there. So thank you. 
um, on behalf of everybody, but definitely concerned people who menstruate in Missouri. <laughs> for this no, Pablo, I think we should just call it, rather than calling it Yuki in Missouri, let's just call it keep the government out of your pants. Use there you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> if only. If only. Um, so I'm not seeing any additional questions. I want to thank um, both Naomi and Susan for just a fantastic presentation. Naomi, thank you for the suggestion. Um, this has been an amazing webinar. Um, I would also like to thank Aaron for that um, wonderful overview of the topic and um, obviously our work, which we are extremely proud of. And we hope that people will visit our website at reproaction.org. You can follow us on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram at reproaction. And we uh, sincerely hope that everybody has a fantastic afternoon and thank you to the attendees for thoughtful questions and uh, your attention today. Everybody take care. Bye bye. Bye. Thank bye. you. Thank you.